today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at the skeleton and the muscles of the building, the concrete, the steel, and other elements that hold everything together. That's right, we're gonna be reviewing a set of structural drawings and talking through the basics of what to look for while reading and interpreting these plans. So let's go. With any new set of drawings dropped in front of you, as I mentioned in all my drawing review videos, I always suggest flipping through all the drawing series, such as your civil, architectural, mechanical, before diving into the details. This will give you a broad understanding of the project as a whole and will help explain what you're about to take on. This will also help reinforce what you're about to read within the structural series to show you how it connects to the rest of the drawing sets. Also, you'll need to read and understand the specifications alongside the drawings, which further explains the requirements of the project in relationship to each of these divisions, such as Division 3, concrete, division four masonry, division five steel, etc. So what is the structure of the building? Well, it's everything that's gonna safely support the longevity of the building, all the future components that will get installed or affixed to the building, all the calculated loads that will interact with the building, such as the weight of humans walking in it or helicopters landing on it, all the environmental elements such as wind, snow, hurricane, seismic data, and much more. The end result is a safe building that is going to withstand the test of time and everything that's thrown at it. The components that will accomplish this are your footings, foundations, slabs, masonry, steel, metal decking, structural framing, cold form metal framing, etc. There are also other structural components such as your curtain wall, your structural glazing systems that are influenced by these structural drawings and the design criteria. So I'm going to assume that we did an initial pass through all the drawings, that being your civil, architectural, mechanical, plumbing, etc. And we're now just going to focus on these structural drawings. So I'm going to do a quick pass through the structural drawings to show you exactly what pages are going to be upcoming during this review. So first, First off, we have S0.1, the general notes. Next is S1.1, foundation slab grade plan. Next, we have S1.2, mechanical penthouse floor and main roof plan. After that, we have S1.3, lobby roof framing plan. Up next is S1.4, the penthouse roof framing plan. After that is S2.1, braced frames. Next is S3.1, typical details. Then we have S4.1, sections. After that is S5.1, sections continued. And then finally we have S5.2, sections continued again. So let's flip back and start with S0.1, the general notes. So a general page is typical of all drawing disciplines. On the structural set, it's very common to be broken up into sections and look just like this, especially given the type and size of this project specifically. So again, I see note sections for the foundation and slab on grade, notes for general concrete, notes for masonry, metal decking, etc. You're gonna read all these notes within each of these sections to get a general idea of interpreting the structural drawings as a whole. We're not gonna be be able to cover every single note just due to time, but we'll focus on a couple notes and get the understanding and the flow of digesting these drawings. So under the foundation and slab on grade section, let's look at note one. I see that the footings are designed for 3000 PSF based on a geotechnical report. I'm gonna pull an example detail from later on in this drawing set to highlight what the footings are on a building. What this drawing detail won't show is that an excavator has to dig this trench at the correct width and depth to allow the next tray to safely work in it to form and pour these footings. Sometimes structural engineers will allow you to bank pour concrete, which means that you pour right into the trenches against the earth, while majority will require you to put this formwork in place prior to pouring concrete. So there's rebar in this detail as well, which will be explained further in this drawing set. Concrete provides compressive strength, while rebar provides tensile strength. The rebar transitions from the footings up into the foundation walls and the columns so that these two are structurally connected. From there, we have anchor bolts in the foundations, which will lead to the base plates, which are shown to be grouted with structural steel on top of that. Not shown in this specific detail is the continuation of the structural steel that transitions up into the roof of the building. Again, we'll look at that later on in this drawing set. So as you can see, you'll have to coordinate majority, if not all of your structural components before you ever pour any concrete because the rebar and the anchor bolts are embedded into the concrete. This is the one of the most critical steps in construction because you're setting the stage for the rest of the trades that are gonna build on these footings and foundations. So the steel layout is only gonna be as good as the base plate layout embedded into the foundation and the foundation is only going to be as good as the soils and the compaction underneath required from the geotechnical report. So going full circle, we're going to return back to that note number one. Okay, so the geotechnical report is a separate report compiled by a geotechnical engineer prior to a structural engineer compiling or really finalizing the structural drawings. The report informs the structural
structural engineer on their design requirements based on how suitable the soil is to build on. So the 3000 PSF or pounds per square foot is the measured strength the concrete will need to be and later translates into a concrete mix design which the concrete contractor is going to order after they receive all their approved submittals. Now I do cover the submittal process in another video of mine if I happen to lose you on that last portion. It's essentially all the paperwork that needs to get reviewed and approved prior to any physical scope taking place on the job site. So in this instance the submittal will likely be a mixed design submittal which shows everything that the concrete is comprised of including the final strength for each concrete mix that will be used throughout the project. A project can have multiple mixed designs for different sections or different areas on the building. So while the concrete is actually being poured there's actually an additional checks and balance via testing of the concrete to ensure that before the next construction activity starts it's not going to fail or collapse based on weaker concrete. Okay there's a little bit more to note one but we're going to move on. So now I'm looking under the concrete section at note one. I see all the concrete is expected to be 4,000 PSI at 28 days. So as I just mentioned a second ago, while the concrete is being poured out of the truck, a testing company is usually taking samples of that concrete in certain increments based on the specifications. These testing increments might be per batch or per certain amount of cubic yards poured. They hold this concrete on the side in a controlled state and at 28 days they run a test on it to ensure that what you poured for the building is actually meeting design. These tests can also be taken at three days, seven days, 21 days, but most specifications ask for 28 day full strength testing. There might also be language that you can't build beyond that point until the testing passes, which influences your project schedule. This is all information that needs to be coordinated as you're building this project out from pre-construction. So under the masonry section, these notes talk about the building codes to follow, the strength of the masonry itself, the mortar to be used. It also talks about additional steel requirements, which are referred to as loose lintels that go above openings to further assist supporting those openings. Now again, depending on how the contract is structured, the mason will likely provide all their CMU, brick, mortar, masonry accessories, but will likely not provide these steel angles. Your steel fabricator will likely provide these steel angles, although the mason will install them. Again, these are just things to consider when structuring and buying out contracts from different contractors to make sure that everything is covered. Also, if these steel angles need to be galvanized, there's a time associated with getting that done, usually three to four weeks, depending on the availability of the galvanizer. This is all stuff that needs to be baked into your project schedule to make sure that you're getting these lintels on site when the masons show up to install them. Okay, skipping over steel, metal decking, cold form metal framing, and moving on to the design codes. So if there's a shop drawing process or submittal process associated with any of these structural components, you'd have to follow all these sections specifically and make sure that you're meeting all this design criteria, especially if you're doing delegated design where you as the contractor are actually taking on professional liability and completing the design in regards to this design criteria. So there are live loads which are movable loads such as furniture and people. There are also dead loads such as floors, walls, roofs, stairs that are permanently affixed to the building. So when calculating how much steel you'll need inside a curtain wall glazing system to ensure that it's structurally sound and that the wind's not going to blow it over, the professional engineer is going to take this design criteria and make sure that it's built into that system. All right, so you're going to read the rest of the notes on this page just like any other section. And if you don't understand something, you could always Google it or just look for mentorship from someone with more experience who can help quickly explain some of these items. Moving on to the next page, S1.1, foundation and slab on grade plan. So there's a nice plan view of the entire project here. We see symbols that are section cut details that if we were to follow them, this would just take us to a new page showing those further details. I also see a chart bottom right, as well as a note section top right and bottom left. Let's take a look bottom left at what it says. So note one tells us the thickness of the slab on grade concrete. It tells us that the slab has embedded WWF reinforcement, which stands for welded wire fabric, which is just steel mesh that will go in the concrete. Remember, some of the drawings will have abbreviation pages to make it easier, some will not. So use other resources as much as you can to better understand what you're reading and what you're looking at. Moving down, note two tells us that the top of slab on grade elevation is 0, 0.00, but what does that mean? So you're going to likely find this on the corresponding civil drawing set, such as an elevation of 782 feet, because the civil set is going to base the elevation on sea level. 782 feet on the civil drawing is equivalent to 000 on your structural and architectural drawings. This is done this way to simplify elevations moving forward in the project. Okay, read the rest of the notes in this bottom left section, and then we're going to jump top right. If there are two notes that say two different things and conflict each other, then that's when you'd write an RFI 
spy just to confirm what was accurate. So these notes have an asterisk next to them, which tells me that they're specific to certain locations based on this specific drawing set. For instance, I see that note three is referencing an HSS or a hollow structural steel post with base plate, and it's called out in these locations so I know exactly where they are. Let's keep going and let's shift over and look at the plan view portion of this drawing. So these footings, foundations, and further steel components are all based on grid lines to help the actual contractor know where they get installed. A surveyor with a GPS helps establish a control point at the beginning of construction that the contractors can use to base these dimensions off of moving forward. So let's zoom in on grid line K and 6.7. So while we're zoomed in on this section of the plan view of this drawing, I'm actually going to pull that chart that was bottom right on this page right next to it to help explain some items. So this dash line we're looking at is actually our footing. Moving on, this solid line is our foundation wall. This square represents both a footing and a pier, as well as a metal column above it. I'll explain all this very shortly so it makes sense. So I'm actually going to start with this number, minus 3.33 feet, right next to the footing. It is common to find this on a footing and foundation plan. It will either be provided like this or an actual elevation depending on how your structural engineer has drawn these drawings. So this minus 3.33 feet is a dimension in relation to that slab elevation, which we read earlier was 0, 0.00 feet. Now, what I don't know about this dimension is what it's actually pointing to. Is it the top of the footing? Is it the bottom of the footing? What is this dimension and where does it go? So I'd pause in this moment and go figure that out before moving on and reading anything further. Okay, I'm going to jump bottom left again, and I'm going to read note number four. It states the top of the footing elevation shall be two foot eight inches below the top of the slab, which we know is that 0, 0.00 unless noted otherwise in brackets. Okay, so our minus 3.33 feet is in brackets, so that's telling us that the top of this footing is minus 3.33 feet below our 0, 0.00, and this gives us a reference point of where this footing needs to be out in the field. Okay, so I don't know if you noticed, but some of the information is provided in a decimal format, and some of it's provided in inches. So you'll likely have to convert that 0.33 feet to a fraction so that it's transferable and easily understandable by the field installers, which is why I always carry a Construction Master Pro, so I'm not wasting time trying to do any of this mental math myself. I can convert that 0.33 feet not only to inches, but then to a fraction right on the calculator with a couple clicks, and then that's transferable right onto a tape measure. It comes out to 3 and 15 sixteenths inch. Once I add that original 3 feet, we get a total of 3 feet, 3 and 15 sixteenths of an inch below 0, 0.00 to the top of the footing. So yes, there is a little bit of math here to calculate where those footings are going to go in relationship to your slab. But that's enough math for now. Let's get back to this plan view. So we're going to look back at this dashed line and I see that there is a WF1 noted along this whole area, which tells me what the footing is going to be. The information relays us back and forth to this chart so that the drawing isn't going to be congested with all this information. This WF1 footing is one foot thick, two foot six inches wide, and explains the rebar that will need to be placed in this footing. It states three number five rebar at the bottom only. The number five rebar indicates the diameter in reference to eighths of an inch. So number three rebar is three eighths of an inch in diameter. Number four is four eighths of an inch in diameter or one half when simplified. Number five is five eighths of an inch in diameter. Now, if we found a WF2 on this drawing set, everything looks to be the same except the rebar is placed on both the bottom and the top. Again, if you're in pre-construction, these are the things you're looking at when calculating rebar costs or install costs of that rebar when putting together your bid. Now, we can also back check the information on this WF1 footing because there's also a section cut detail right here. Let's click on it and see where it takes us. Okay, I see our footing. I see three number five rebar placed at the bottom. It all matches. So let's jump back to that other page again. So next to our continuous footing, we also have this large square here, which is just where the steel is going to transfer up into the building and then into the roof. It's larger because this is where all the weight is going to transfer down from the roof through that steel into the earth. So along with the plan view and a legend, I'm also going to pull up detail G on S4.1, showing the section cut of this detail so we can look at all three items together. So on the plan view detail, we have a C1, a P2, and an F4. I find these corresponding items on the legend to see what we're building. We're going to start with the footing since it's at the bottom. So F4 is a six foot by six foot pad that's poured at one foot two inches thick. Also, we see again that rebar is going to be required on this F4, but we're going to make more sense of it by looking at the detail itself. So on top of that footing is going to be a concrete pier, also referred to as P2. P2 is going to be a 24 inch by 24 inch pier or column. This doesn't show us how tall the pier is. So again, we're going to go back to 
that note section where note number three states that the pier elevations shall be eight inches below the top of the slab, which we know is 0, 0.00 feet unless noted otherwise. Again, we're kind of doing this dance around the drawings to understand where everything is in elevation because it's critical on the structural set in particular. So there's definitely a lot of sizing and a lot of math going on here, which is why the concrete contractor is going to produce a set of rebar shop drawings. The steel vendor is going to produce a set of steel shop drawings. These rebar shop drawings show all this information with greater depth so that the field installer isn't wasting time doing all these calculations a day before the concrete truck's about to show up. This is ideally done months in advance for each of these disciplines. I will make a video specifically on how to read rebar shop drawings in the future, but I wanted to first show you how those drawings get created and where they originate from. So last we see the mark C1, we correspond it to the chart and we see a W10 by 49. So this is actually how steel is notated on a structural drawing set. The W stands for wide flange beam. There are other letters that can be used which depict other styles of beam for other scenarios. The 10 stands for the depth of the beam and the 49 stands for the weight in pounds per linear foot. So I've got this beam highlighted on the detail. The last piece is actually how this beam is attached, which is via that base plate that we talked about earlier on. The base plate provides the width, the length, the thickness on this chart. When looking at the detail itself, we can confirm that these details actually match each other. So essentially, you're just going to keep doing this process. You're going to work yourself around this whole building, all these columns, all these pads, all these footings, all these foundation walls. You're going to start to build this building three-dimensionally in your mind before you even step foot on site. Remember too, the structural drawings are not going to show trenching, form work, or potentially other aspects of architectural design such as waterproofing or plumbing design such as where the penetrations for plumbing piping are going to go through the foundation walls. So the structural drawings will actually show you how to additionally reinforce these openings and where these pipes go through the wall because when you create an opening, you're creating a weak point in that wall. So you have to add additional rebar, typically in the form of a diamond box out. And then the structural engineer should provide details of what that looks like in the detail section of the drawings. So moving on to the next drawing is S1.2, the mechanical penthouse floor and the main roof plan. And we're going to approach this exactly like we approached that last drawing. We're going to start with the plan view and then we're going to kind of work our way around. We're going to read all the notes and then we're going to take a further look into the specific details. And that's going to make us jump to other pages with section cuts and then we're going to kind of go back and forth so we understand what we're looking at. So I'm going to zoom in on this section of the drawing and I see that there's four pieces of either equipment or some drain pans that need to be supported further. It tells me to go read note three. So I'm going to go read note three. So note three tells me that the iron workers are going to install additional steel angles, steel frames to further support whatever these things are. We'd have to go reference the mechanical and the plumbing drawings to figure out what this equipment is or if they're just drain pans. So this is where things get a little more complicated and you need to do a little more coordination than just going and looking at the mechanical and the plumbing drawings. You'll actually need to reach out and touch base with your mechanical contractor and your plumbing contractor. The plumbing contractor, for instance, may be able to purchase three different drain pans where the size might vary slightly. So you don't want to just assume that the dimension on the drawing is accurate. You want to confirm with the plumber to make sure that you're not oversizing it and that the drain pan is just going to fall through. That's where the coordination aspect comes into play of looking at different shop drawings and doing a coordination review prior to any install. So moving back up to grid line K in 6.7 where we started on the last page, I see that that column is there that we installed earlier. It's going to have connections to additional beams. Specifically here we see a W27 by 84 on each side. We can find the specifics of all these connections to all these pieces of steel throughout this drawing set. If we want to understand what this section cut looks like, we'd actually go to detail B on S5.1. So we've actually flipped to this detail B on S5.1. We see that W27 by 84 that we were just talking about. We see cold form metal framing. We see the facade, which tells us that we'd have to go to the architectural drawings to get more information on. And we see metal decking. Now at the top here, we've got a couple symbols which are going to be familiar to any iron worker indicating what gets shop welded, what gets field welded, and what type of welds to provide for each scenario. So for the remainder of the drawings, you're just going to kind of follow this process and reading and understanding the different elements of how this structure is built by navigating through the drawing set, reading all the descriptions, all the note sections, looking at all the charts, everything kind of ties together. And remember that the structural drawings impact the architectural, mechanical, and electrical, and plumbing drawings, and vice versa. So you're really reading everything together to get that full picture. I might extend each discipline, such as your architectural, structural, into separate series beyond this to further dive into details of building construction in general, but this video should give you a high-level understanding of how to approach a structural set of drawings. And as I mentioned earlier, I will be making a video specifically on reading rebar shop drawings, so stay tuned for that as well. Okay.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed reading structural drawings with me today and I hope you learned something from this video. If you're not currently following me and you'd like to see more content like this, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Also, if you are a subscriber, don't forget to drop a comment below. Let me know what's going on in your life in the world of construction. And as always, be better, build better, and bye for now. Aww.